Chapter 10, Respiration and Artificial Ventilation. So Chapter 9 dealt a lot with ensuring that the patient's airway was open, that it was patent. And as long as the airway is open, then we know that we can exchange air from outside the body into the lungs and in reverse. Uh, and that's a really important component to, to understand that the airway itself has to be open, but we also have to make sure that we're moving an effective volume of air to allow for enough oxygen intake and enough off-gassing of carbon dioxide. That movement of air is what we consider ventilation. And ventilation, combined with respiration, which is actually the exchange of gases, ensures that the patient's able to sustain life over a prolonged period of time. Now, one thing that we're going to evaluate in this chapter is whether or not breathing is adequate. So think to yourself, what is adequate? And as we, as we explore through this chapter, what we want to identify is whether or not there's enough gas being exchanged within the lungs and whether or not that gas is getting down to the cells themselves. And if so, is it enough in order to sustain life? Is it enough to meet all of the physiologic needs of the body at any given time? If it falls short of that threshold, whatever it may be, we would consider it to be inadequate. And any time that a patient's respiratory volume is inadequate, we need to take actions in order to intervene. That may be in the form of supplemental oxygen, or it may actually be us ventilating the patient ourselves externally using a BVM or other device. So as a quick review from Chapter 9 and also Chapter 7, or perfusion, let's talk a little bit about the mechanics of breathing. Remember that the process of ventilation is the actual exchange or movement of air. So as our chest cavity expands from contraction of our intercostal muscles and diaphragm, the pressure inside of our chest drops. In order to equalize, the air from outside of our body rushes into the chest, equalizes the pressure inside the lungs and the, um, to the pressure outside the body. As our intercostal muscles and diaphragm relax, it compresses the air inside of our chest. Since it forms a higher pressure inside the chest, the air rushes back out into the atmosphere, again in an attempt to equalize. So ventilation is, is just a matter of pressures, trying to balance out pressure outside the body to pressure inside the body. And as long as our airway is patent and we're able to mechanically move air in and out, we're in good shape. Now, what else we need to occur is the process of respiration. So respiration occurs at the alveolar and at the cellular level. And what it does is it allows oxygen and carbon dioxide to move from gradients of higher concentration down to areas of low concentration. So as I breathe in, the oxygen inside my alveoli, the concentration of oxygen in that air, is much higher than the concentration of oxygen inside the blood. So what happens is through the process of diffusion, the oxygen diffuses through the alveoli wall into the capillaries and into the blood. The oxygen then binds to the hemoglobin on the red blood cell, and the blood flow or the circulation throughout the body transports that oxygen to different parts of the body as needed. Once we get down to the capillaries again at the end of the arteries um, before it goes back into, into the venous system, then at the capillary level, those gases once again exchange. And the gases outside of the capillaries are now low in oxygen, so the oxygen diffuses through the capillary wall into the interstitial space and ultimately into the cells. As that oxygen is diffused into the cells and the carbon dioxide is, is removed, that is the process of cellular respiration. And that also defines what perfusion is we need to be able to deliver oxygen to all the cells of the body and to remove the carbon dioxide waste products that are derived from the process of metabolism. So as long as we're able to deliver the oxygen, remove the carbon dioxide, we are perfusing. And that is the big thing that we're evaluating as we look at whether or not a patient is breathing adequately. Are they perfusing? And although we aren't able to take blood samples or cell, uh, tissue samples and look at them under microscopes or determine whether or not diffusion is actually occurring, what we can look at is things like mental status. Is the brain being perfused with oxygen? If not, we would suggest or we would expect the patient to be somewhat altered, confused, or even unconscious. Um, is the uh, heart being perfused adequately with enough oxygen? If not, we would expect the patient to develop chest pain, uh, fatigue, general circulatory issues, 
maybe their skin parameters would, would be off. So there's a lot of external things that we can look at when we assess our patient to determine whether or not uh, the process of perfusion is occurring adequately. So inhalation we talked about is an uh, active process, it requires energy, requires metabolism in order for it to occur. And it's because those muscles are utilizing oxygen and glucose in order to contract, right? They need that energy to, in order to work effectively. So inhalation requires energy, whereas exhalation is passive. Exhalation allows our chest muscles simply to relax. As they relax, they compress the air inside the chest and the air rushes out passively. Now, tidal volume is the amount of air that we exchange with every breath. And on average, an adult is going to exchange about 500 milliliters of air with each breath that they take. If we take our tidal volume, we multiply that by the number of times that our patient is breathing in any given minute, and that gives us our overall minute volume. So we know that we can all hyperventilate ourselves um, on purpose for a short period of time. But even in doing so, we will begin to get fatigued and our body will stop us from doing it. And we'll end up passing out. And what that means is that the minute volume is not appropriate for the exchange of gases that my body needs at that given time. So if I were to purposely try to hyperventilate myself right now, I could do it. I can consciously make myself breathe too fast. But what's going to end up happening is I'm going to breathe off so much carbon dioxide and take in so much excessive oxygen that my body is going to recognize that as a threat. And the body is actually going to take action to stop it. It's either going to convince my brain that I need to stop and slow down, or it's going to allow me to simply pass out. And in passing out, it's almost like a reset mechanism. What happens is we're not delivering enough oxygen to the brain in that situation. And I'm sorry, we're delivering plenty of oxygen, but we're not retaining enough carbon dioxide. So the brain shuts itself down temporarily and allows our respiratory pattern to reset itself. So again, minute volume must be adequate to meet the the uh, metabolic needs of the body at any given time. And that minute volume is going to go up or go down based on what we're doing. If we're playing sports or running around, it's going to increase. If we are sleeping, we have less oxygen usage, so therefore the minute volume will decrease. So this slide has a couple of the concepts that we just discussed. Uh, dead air space is kind of a new one though. And dead air sp space is simply the amount of air that is left inside the lungs that doesn't get exchanged with each breath. Now, normally we have a little bit of dead air space and it's not a big deal. As a matter of fact, it's, it's probably beneficial to us. Um, however, think about an asthmatic patient. As their bronchioles constrict down and they're not able to move enough air in and out of the chest, we have a lot of dead air space, a lot of air that gets trapped inside the chest and does not get exchanged. In those circumstances, we have a buildup of carbon dioxide. We're not breathing in fresh oxygen. And therefore, all we have is carbon dioxide that's being exhaled and getting trapped inside the chest there. And as you can imagine, lack of oxygen coming in and too much carbon dioxide being retained is going to be a bad thing for the body. The alveolar ventilation then is the process of bringing air into the alveoli and allowing for the exchange of gases or diffusion to occur at the alveoli level. Um, and again, that's typically going to be between oxygen and carbon dioxide. And diffusion is simply the process or movement of gases from a high concentration to low concentration, something we just discussed a few minutes ago. Internal respiration is ultimately our biggest, uh, biggest goal. We want to ensure that the cells are receiving the oxygen they need and that they're getting rid of all the carbon dioxide that they're producing. So as we evaluate our patients, it's going to be easy to see external respiration as far as whether or not they're moving air whether they're breathing at the appropriate rate, the appropriate volume, etc. It's not easy to determine internal respiration. So we have to understand the processes and look at other clues. And some of those that we just discussed, mental status, skin parameters. Um, we can look at things like vital signs and a few other indicators as well. Uh, we'll learn all about those as we go throughout the semester. There's that term cellular respiration again the exchange of gases at the cellular level, which is necessary for aerobic metabolism, the process of metabolizing using oxygen itself. As a quick review, if oxygen does not exist, remember that that is called anaerobic metabolism. So metabolism with oxygen is aerobic, without oxygen is anaerobic. 
and the byproduct of anaerobic metabolism is going to be a bunch of acid. It'll be a lot of waste products, and it's a very inefficient way to metabolize, so it produces very little energy as a result. Now this slide gives you just a little bit of a clue as to how the cardiopulmonary system works together in order to allow us to sustain life. The mechanics of breathing, right? If the chest is not able to expand enough, if it's not able to expand at a rate um, that is appropriate to generate the, the needed tidal volume, if any of those things get interrupted, if, uh, if the airway is occluded, any of that stuff occurs, we're, we're not able to bring in oxygen. We're not able to give off carbon dioxide. In addition to that, then, if the exchange of gases is interrupted for whatever reason, maybe there's fluid inside the lungs, um, maybe something like carbon monoxide, CO, right, which is a poison, maybe that has bound to our hemoglobin and now we're not able to attach oxygen. Um, there's a, a handful of things that can occur that prevent the exchange of gases themselves. And then we have circulation issues. If I don't have enough blood, if my heart's not pumping fast enough, if I'm not generating an adequate blood pressure, all of these things play into the circulation. So essentially, I need to have an open airway. I need to be breathing at a rate that is appropriate to meet the oxygen demands of the body. And I need my heart to be working efficiently so that I can circulate the blood and maintain an appropriate pressure to deliver the oxygen all the way down to the cells and push the oxygen out of the capillaries and into the cellular areas. So our end goal here, oxygenation of the cells, which is perfusion. And I'm going to just simply read this out loud because it's really important. In order for oxygenation to occur, in order for us to achieve perfusion, here's what needs to happen. Respiratory rate and depth must be in the effective range. There must be a sufficient space in the alveoli for gas exchange to occur. There must be sufficient blood within the red blood cells, or with red blood cells rather, to transport the oxygen. And there must be sufficient pressure in the blood vessels to push the oxygen into the cells. Now, I'm going to say this one more time because this is a, a great summary. It's a very, very basic idea of what perfusion is, but something that you need to really, really understand. In order for perfusion to occur, we need respiratory rate and depth. It must be in the effective range. So the, the rate at which they're breathing and the volume at which they're moving must be appropriate for the patient's age and oxygen demands. There must be sufficient space in the alveoli for the gas exchange to occur. So in the instance of asthmatics or congestive heart failure patients or even COPD patients with emphysema, where we have issues where we don't have enough surface area within the alveoli for gas exchange to occur because of some type of blockage. There must be sufficient blood with the red blood cells to transport the oxygen. So I need to have plenty of red blood cells for the oxygen to attach to, and then I need to have enough blood to actually circulate it throughout the entire body. And so long as I have enough blood and the heart is working like it's supposed to, then that should hopefully generate a sufficient pressure in the blood vessels to push the oxygen into the cells. This is the concept of perfusion, and this is what we're trying to evaluate when we're looking at our patient's overall respiratory function, determining whether or not it's adequate and whether or not we need to intervene. So respiration itself. Brain and body cells need a steady supply of oxygen. We know that. Here's what you probably don't realize, though. You know, in first responder and, and everything else in life, we've always talked about oxygen as, as being the number one requirement for life. And that's true. We need oxygen. That's what helps keep us alive. That's what fuels our body. However, carbon dioxide is equally important within the body. The body has to maintain a very neutral pH state, a neutral state in which there's a balance between acids and alkalis. And what that means is that it is just as important to have appropriate levels of carbon dioxide in our body as it is oxygen. And as a matter of fact, it's so important that the body actually bases its respiratory functions off of carbon dioxide levels, not oxygen levels. Now, there are some rare exceptions to that, but generally speaking, for a healthy population, the body itself utilizes carbon dioxide levels to determine respiratory function, not oxygen. So what the body does is it looks at the quantity or the concentration of carbon dioxide in the body. And we have these things called chemoreceptors within our blood vessels. Those chemoreceptors sense the carbon dioxide levels, 
and they'll send a message to the brain that says, hey, carbon dioxide levels are too high or they're too low. And the brain will adjust our respiratory function in order to try to balance it out. For instance, let's say that I decide to go out and run a marathon. For those of you who know me, we know that's not very uh, practical. It's actually never going to happen. But let's just pretend. So I go out to run a marathon, and over a long period of time, my body's working, my muscles are working, and the increase, or I'm sorry, the demand in oxygen increases significantly while I'm outside running. As that demand in oxygen increases, I start to breathe faster to take in oxygen. But in fact, what happens is as I'm running and I'm using all that energy, I'm producing a ton of carbon dioxide, right? Carbon dioxide is the waste product that is developed through the meta uh, metabolic process. So as I go for this run, and I'm using all this, this uh, oxygen up in order to, to provide my body the energy I need to run, I'm producing carbon dioxide as waste. As these carbon dioxide levels inside my body increase, these chemoreceptors pick that up, send a message to the brain that says, hey, the levels are too high. The brain then will increase my respiratory rate. I will start breathing faster, not to bring in more oxygen, but to off-gas more carbon dioxide, trying to maintain that neutral pH level. So increased activity level results in increased energy production, which has a byproduct of carbon dioxide. As those carbon dioxide levels increase, the brain, through the medulla oblongata, actually senses the levels, controls my respiratory function, and will tell me to start to breathe faster in order to off-gas that extra carbon dioxide and balance things out. Now in return, as I'm breathing faster, not only am I off-gassing the carbon dioxide, but I'm also bringing in additional oxygen. And that's exactly how the whole process should occur. If I have too much CO2, that means I don't have enough oxygen. So I breathe off carbon dioxide, and I take in the, the oxygen itself to replace it, and that's how I maintain that balance. Now conversely, what happens if I have not enough carbon dioxide, right? Um, if for whatever reason, uh, well, we know people, I'm sure, that have things like uh, panic attacks or anxiety or something like that. What ends up happening is if we're breathing too fast, then we're off-gassing too much carbon dioxide, and as a result, we're going to end up retaining too much oxygen. Now, although retaining too much oxygen can be bad, that's probably not going to be an immediate life threat. But by not having enough carbon dioxide to meet that, those neutral pH balances in the body, that is a life threat. So if I'm breathing too fast and I breathe off too much carbon dioxide, then that, that throws off the pH levels in the body, that's a bad thing. The chemoreceptors will sense that. They'll say, hey, there's not enough CO2 in here. They'll send that message back to the medulla oblongata. The medulla oblongata sends messages out to the, the lungs then, and the lungs will actually slow down an attempt to try to retain carbon dioxide. So everything is a, about trying to maintain those neutral balances between carbon dioxide and oxygens and making a, uh, maintaining the neutral pH levels. All right, so the cardiopulmonary system works together in order to exchange the gases, circulate the gases throughout the body, deliver oxygen to the cells, and deliver uh, carbon dioxide back to the lungs in order to off-gas it and maintain those balances. So we've already kind of talked about this stuff, right? Compensation for hypoxia or hy hypercapnia. So hypercapnia just means that we have too much carbon dioxide in our body, right? Hypocapnia would be the opposite, too low. But let's explore really quick hypoxia. Now hypoxia, meaning that we have too little oxygen uh, circulating throughout our bloodstream, Typically, our body does not sense hypoxia and adjust respiratory function because of that. However, with our COPD patients, those patients that are chronically in respiratory distress, and they've, they've been in that state for um, months or even years now, right? Um, what ends up happening is we're constantly retaining carbon dioxide in that, that COPD state. And that increased carbon dioxide ends up kind of ruining those chemoreceptors. Uh, over time, they, they stop working efficiently, and as a result, the body switches over to what's called a hypoxic drive. So for our chronically ill uh, respiratory patients, and COPD being the primary example, 
their, their bodies, because those chemoreceptors stop working properly, switch over and instead of adjusting respiratory rate and volume based on carbon dioxide, those COPD patients now base it strictly on the oxygen levels. So that's actually a, a change, right? Again, the healthy population looks at carbon dioxide levels, but that chronically ill respiratory patient with COPD looks at oxygen levels itself. And as the oxygen levels begin to drop, then the body will start to pick up. Now this is important to remember because as we assess this patient with COPD, we need to quickly identify that they are a COPD patient. There's plenty of ways to do that. But once we identify that they're a COPD patient, let's say that their SpO2 is at 92%. Now 92% is slightly below 95, which is what we consider to be good. Um, however, do we want to treat a patient, a COPD patient, at 92% SpO2 with oxygen? And the answer is most likely not. We need to kind of talk to our patient. We need to assess their overall respiratory quality and function. You know, what's their mental status? What's their work of breathing, right? We need to assess a, a multitude of things. But generally speaking, simply having an SpO2 of 92% is not an indication to provide oxygen, especially to a COPD patient. Because with COPD, the patients utilize that hypoxia in order to maintain their respiratory drive. If we give them supplemental oxygen and we bring their SpO2 up to 98%, that can actually harm their respiratory drive because, again, their body relies on that level of hypoxia in order to maintain its respiratory functions. All right, moving on then. So, our body will do a whole bunch of things to try to compensate for respiratory dysfunction. Um, anytime the body is in distress, what ends up happening is we're going to increase our respiratory rate in order to meet the oxygen demands of the body, get rid of the excess carbon dioxide. Now, because of that VQ match, the ventilation and perfusion uh, correlation, if our respiratory rate increases, so must our heart rate. And by increasing our heart rate, it increases the circulation of blood throughout the body. And all that does is as I'm taking in more oxygen, it's delivering more red blood cells to the, uh, uh, to the alveoli there, and it's soaking up that oxygen. And in return, it's delivering all that carbon dioxide to the, to the alveoli in order to actually push it out and get rid of it. Okay, So they are tied together. If my respiratory rate increases, so should my heart rate. Now, inadequate breathing. So there's a difference here between distress and, and respiratory failure or something that is, um, you know, a, a mild issue compared to a major issue. If I am outside and I am, uh, I go for a run and at the end I'm breathing heavy, right? My body is functioning fine. I'm meeting the oxygen demands of the body. I'm able to balance everything out. It's not a big deal. However, there are times that maybe I'm sick. And let's say that I develop a pneumonia. And because of the pneumonia, I'm not able to exchange as much air as I typically do in a healthy state. I may feel just slightly short of breath. And because I feel slightly short of breath, I'm in a mild respiratory distress, my body's going to compensate for that. And since I can't exchange the same volume of air with my pneumonia, I'm going to therefore increase the rate a little bit to try to maintain the, the same tidal volume, or I'm sorry, the same minute volume. Um, and in that circumstance, I'm fine, no big deal. Should I go to the hospital, if I were to call 911 for an ambulance and they look at me and I've got this pneumonia and, uh, and I'm at you know 93%, maybe they're gonna give me a nasal cannula with one to two liters of oxygen, a very low flow. And that would be fine, that would be appropriate. But what happens now, when my patient is really struggling to breathe. And they're breathing at 30 to 32 times a minute. Um, their, their eyes are kind of wide. You can tell that they're, they're really scared, they're distressed. Maybe they're in that tripoding position. All those things should clue us into this is a, a significant or a severe respiratory distress. And these are patients where I need to be more aggressive with my oxygen therapy. Maybe instead of a low flow nasal cannula, I'm giving them a little higher flow nasal cannula, or more than likely, I'm probably going to be giving them a non-rebreather mask. But in these situations, the patient is still in respiratory distress. And we know that because their rate is going up. 
the body is still compensating and it's tr still trying to meet the needs uh, or the oxygen needs that it has. So it just continues to increase the rate and along with it the, the heart rate in order to meet those oxygen demands. However, there comes a point where the body just gets tired, right? The body becomes fatigued and that respiratory rate may start to drop or it may be so incredibly high that they're just unable to even, there's not enough time to exchange gases, right? We're not able to get enough air into the lungs because of the, the rate of the respiratory uh, drive. And in those circumstances there, uh, we would determine it to be inadequate. So if the rate is so high that they're unable to exchange gases or worse yet, when the rate starts to drop, when the rate starts to drop, that's an indication of respiratory failure. The, the muscles within the, the chest cavity are just exhausted, they're fatigued, and they're going to uh, start to shut down and not work any longer. In instances where we determine that the patient is in respiratory failure or they are breathing inadequately, we must take aggressive action. And anytime a patient is breathing inadequately, we must ventilate for them. Let me say that again. Anytime that a patient is breathing inadequately, we must ventilate for them. That means we must get the BVM out and we'll start bagging them. Now, a lot of times I'll have students say, okay, well, you know, if the, the patient is awake and talking to us and they're breathing inadequately, you know, what do we do? Because let's be honest, if I were to walk up to any one of you right now with a BVM, plaster a, a, a mask against your face, hold it against your face, and start puffing air into your face, if you're conscious and awake, you're probably not going to tolerate that, right? You're going to resist that. However, if a patient is to the point that they have dropped into respiratory failure, if they are breathing inadequately like that, then we should have seen mental status changes a long time ago. These patients are more than likely going to be in and out of consciousness or just downright unconscious in this circumstance. So we should be able to ventilate them using that BVM without much resistance. So looking at this picture here, you know, look at this patient. What do we see? I see that she's in this tripoding position, right? She's got her arms kind of braced out to the front there, trying to expand her, her back and her chest cavity a little bit to allow for additional air movement. Uh, she looks just very tired, kind of those sunken eyes. Um, these are all indications of, of a patient that's really sick. You know, they're really in, in respiratory distress. We also observe that this is a child, right? Maybe 10, 11 years old, somewhere in that ballpark. And we know that kids thrive on oxygen. The younger the person is, the more that they really, really need that oxygen and the, the faster they're going to show signs of any type of distress. So we know that with kids, we should be especially aggressive with oxygen therapy. All right, so signs of adequate breathing would be the exact opposite of everything we've been talking about, right? The rate should be, respiratory rate should be appropriate. Their pulse rate should be appropriate. Their mental status should be functioning. You know, consider ourselves right now. Go look at yourself in the mirror. Everything you see about yourself from being awake and alert, answering questions appropriately, um, you know, normal uh, respiratory efforts, normal rate, good skin parameters, good mental status, all those things, those are all indications that somebody is perfusing or breathing adequately in this case. Any inadequate breathing would be uh, everything you see here listed on the screen. Lung sounds are going to be a big indication. We may have wheezing. We could have stridor. Uh, gurgling, right? Those things are indicating airway obstructions. Um, it could be a head injury from trauma that is affecting our respiratory drive, right? We, we talked about the medulla oblongata, which is actually on the brain stem itself. And under certain uh, uh, traumatic situations where the brain is injured, we may not be breathing effectively from that. There's just a multitude of things. Um, so we have to really look at our patient and, and identify when something is wrong. What is abnormal about this patient? Why is it abnormal? And what is the most effective way to treat it? Um, low oxygen saturation, talking about this down here at the bottom, less than 95%. So if we think back to our SpO2, right? 95% and above is considered normal. 90 to 95% is, or I'm sorry, 90 to 94% is considered uh, mildly hypoxic. 85 to 89 is moderately hypoxic. And anything below 85% is severely hypoxic. And now those are thresholds and nothing more. Because I can tell you that an adult at 91% is, is not something that concerns me very much whatsoever. But if you show me a two-year-old at 91%, 
that's a really big deal. And that gives me a lot of reason to be concerned. So we need to look at our patient. We need to look at their overall presentation, their age, and everything else in order to kind of customize what is considered normal or not normal. In kids especially, we'll look for retractions and nasal flaring. Remember that retractions is the intercostal muscles within the ribs um, that are kind of sucking in every time they try to breathe. And it's just a big indication of a lot of respiratory effort trying to exchange that air. Um, and an issue that we're probably going to have to address very, very quickly. Because with all that additional effort, they're going to uh, get tired and fatigue out a lot sooner. And as a result, we're going to see them go into respiratory failure. So we need to see... Um, or we need to identify quickly those, those signs of increased work of breathing and then take steps in order to try to balance it out and help it, typically through that supplemental oxygen. So the term hypoxia uh, addresses the decreased oxygen in the tissues itself. Um, and that hypoxia, if we look at it from an external standpoint, is most likely going to present with some level of either uh, cyanosis in the skin or maybe a pale uh, pale presentation to the skin and it's also probably going to be associated with some form of altered mental status confusion semi-consciousness etc depending on the the degree to which they are hypoxic um, and there's a, a lot of different causes of hypoxia right you know some examples here a patient trapped in a fire you know in that situation there most likely uh, they have some airway burns where where we're unable to exchange enough air in order to meet the oxygen demands. Um, they could have inhaled a bunch of smoke. They could have done damage to the lungs, a whole bunch of stuff. So lots of causes for hypoxia. Inadequate breathing, then, we talked about already, that if we identify that a patient is not able to sustain life based on their uh, current respiratory um, uh, rate and volume, that we need to take action to breathe for them in order to keep them alive. Uh, when do I intervene? So often respiratory failure patients will be breathing and conscious. Um, and that is, is only true to a degree. As a matter of fact, it kind of contradicts something I said a few minutes ago. And I will uh, reiterate that if they go into respiratory failure, then it's only a matter of time. And I'm talking seconds into maybe a minute or two before they're completely unconscious um, or at least greatly altered. And in those circumstances, we should be able to go ahead and apply that BVM and start bagging them. All right, so getting into positive pressure ventilations, you know, if we get to the point where our patient's not breathing adequately, and we do need to bag for them or we need to breathe for them, we're going to use positive pressure ventilation to do so. There's a few different ways or methods we can do it. Uh, we're going to concentrate primarily on using a bag valve mask, but understand that using a pocket mask is just as effective and arguably, the American Heart Association actually says that doing mouth to mask ventilations is preferred over um, bag valve mask ventilations. So, just kind of a, uh, a unique thought there. So, the pot or the, the process of utilizing positive pressure ventilation or PPV is actually by forcing air uh, that's under pressure into the chest cavity itself. And what that does is it forces the air down to the alveoli and allows for that gas exchange to occur. Okay, so we're just doing what the body does on its own, but we're doing it externally if the body's unable to take care of itself. So there are negative side effects, though. Just about everything we do has some level of consequence one way or another. In this situation here, gastric distension is probably one of the bigger issues. Uh, if we force too much air down in the stomach, it can cause the, the stomach to develop air bubbles. It can cause vomiting. And whenever we have vomiting with our patients, we know that we're at risk for aspiration and other airway obstruction. But the other big thing here, decrease in cardiac output and hyperventilation. So those two things are almost going to work hand in hand. The decrease in cardiac output, as we uh, build up the pressure inside the chest there, it actually applies pressure to the heart and it kinks off the blood return to the heart. It reduces the blood supply that's coming back to the heart itself. And in doing so, if we have less coming in, obviously we're going to have less coming out. So now we're circulating less blood, meaning that we're able to distribute less oxygen, our blood pressure is dropping, so we're unable to perfuse the oxygen into the cells as well, or at all. And if we hyperventilate our patient, where we're breathing in too much oxygen and taking out too much carbon dioxide, that'll actually call, cause the blood vessels in the, uh, the brain to constrict down, and will hypoperfuse the brain, causing, obviously, 
some pretty uh, significant issues. We want to make sure that we're always oxygenating the brain, one of the most important organs in the body that we have to preserve. So there's a lot of downside to this. So what does that mean? Simply plastering a mask to somebody's face and pumping, you know, squeezing the bag um, is, is potentially dangerous if you don't do it the correct way. We have to make sure that we're maintaining a good seal. We have to make sure that we're squeezing the bag just to the appropriate volume so that we're not giving too much volume. And most importantly, we have to make sure we're doing it at the right rate. Now, it's easy for us to remember that when using a, a bag valve mask that we should ventilate the patient 10 to 12 times per minute. No problem. But what I challenge you is in, in the situation where you're actually bagging a patient and your, your uh, um, fight or flight mechanism is kind of activated, you know, you're, you're pumped up, you've got a bunch of adrenaline rush throughout the body. Um, what ends up happening is that 10 to 12 times per minute comes out to be something more like 15 to 20 times per minute. And the reason is, you know, we're counting. So if I know that if I'm going to ventilate somebody 10 times a minute, 60 seconds divided by 10 times a minute, that's one breath every six seconds. And instead of me counting 1, 1,000, 2, 1,000, 3, 1,000, 4, 1,000, what it ends up being is 1, 1,000, 2, 1,000, 3, 1,000, 4, 1,000, 5, 1,000, 6, 1,000 bag. And what the result is, is that I'm hyperventilating that patient, right? I'm breathing off too much carbon dioxide. I'm going to hypoperfuse the brain in that situation. It's going to make them become even worse. And I'm decreasing the cardiac output. All of these things play together. And it has some pretty significant consequences. So be very mindful of the rate at which you're back. Utilize a watch or something like that if you, if you can. Um, if you have digital and tidal CO2 or capnography readings, that's going to be beneficial. And we'll talk a lot in class about different ways that we can make sure that we're bagging at the appropriate rate. So do not ventilate a patient who's actively vomiting. I think that makes sense, right? What do we need to do for a patient that has vomit in the airway? I would recommend that you stop, that you suction the airway. We can also roll the patient into the recovery position if, if there's no contraindication to do so. And as we're bagging our patient, we want to watch the rise in chest, or I'm sorry, the, the rise and fall of their chest uh, to make sure that we're getting good bilateral chest rise, right? We want to make sure that both sides of the lungs are rising equally, and that should be a big indication that we're delivering the air down to the chest. Imagine if I had a, uh, an airway obstruction at the top of my trachea, right? Something in the very back of my throat, right at the glottic opening there. I could be maintaining a great seal and squeezing that bag, but if I don't see chest rise, that should tell me that, hey, there's an obstruction somewhere. Somewhere between the mouth and the lungs, there's an obstruction, and I'm not delivering enough air. So I need to take steps in order to address that. Maybe you go in with forceps and pull out the obstruction. Maybe we need to insert some type of uh, breathing adjunct, right, a noropharyngeal or a nasopharyngeal. Who knows? But I need to identify when my, my positive pressure ventilations are not being effective and try to figure out what the underlying problem is and fix it. So again, really important that as we're bagging our patient, we're doing it appropriately, we're making sure that it's working, um, and that we should explain the procedure to the patient. Now, even on patients that are unconscious, we still need to be talking to them, right? We need to explain to the patient everything we're doing and why. And it's even more important when the patient is unconscious that we do that. Because somebody who's awake and talking to us can see what we're doing. And as they watch what we're doing and they hear us talking, they're able to anticipate what's going on. But imagine now if you were unconscious but still aware of your surroundings, right? You're laying there, your eyes are closed, you can't control anything, you can't move your body, you can't open your eyes or talk, but you're aware of your surroundings. And all of a sudden you start to feel, you know, uh, people... Uh, manipulating your body, smothering your face, doing all sorts of stuff. It's going to be very scary. And what we know is that even though patients are unconscious, a lot of times they're still very much aware of what's going on around them. So we need to talk to them. We need to reassure them. We need to explain to them what we're doing. And we need to be treating them just as if they were awake and able to talk back to us. Okay, that is really, really important. CPAP or BiPAP. We use uh, CPAP in the ambulances, continuous positive airway pressure. And what that is, it's a special mask that we were able to generate the seal around the face. Um, it holds the mask on there. It maintains its own seal. And it's just this continuous, this constant pressure of air going into the lungs. Now, what that does is it helps to maintain the inflation of the alveoli, and it helps to displace any fluid that may be trapped in there. 
A lot of times CPAP is something that we're going to use with our congestive heart failure or near drowning patients. However, um, it makes it very difficult for the patient to breathe out, right? The, the CPAP is a constant inward pressure. It's, it's, it's constantly flowing air into the chest. So in order to exhale, the patient has to uh, really forcefully try to overcome that pressure in order to force the air out. That's a very uncomfortable feeling for them. For patients who have never had CPAP before, it usually takes them a while to get used to it in order for them to tolerate it. So again, explaining that to them, here, here's what it's going to feel like. These are going to be some of the challenges. I just need you to stay calm. I'm going to be right here with you. We'll work through this together and really kind of guiding them through it. And we'll talk more about these individual procedures and, and stuff like that in class, okay? Mouth to mask ventilation again, using a pocket mask or other barrier device is the recommended method by the American Heart Association. That is going to be an exam question, so keep that in mind. All uh, right, moving on then. Um, so at this point here, um, it's going to go through step-by-step -step procedures for uh, delivering different or utilizing different devices. I'm not going to cover that in the discussion component here because these are things that we need to address specifically in class. So I'm going to skip through these procedure slides, and we're going to just simply talk about um, some additional uh, physiology of breathing itself. One thing I do want to address, though, uh, a couple important things to remember while using different devices and also some things that are going to be on the exam. So first and foremost, um, with the BVM, a couple exam questions that, that you really need to think about, right? What is the appropriate flow rate for a bag valve mask? Now, the book will tell you that we should be flowing a BVM at approximately 15 liters per minute. Um, and that is the absolute truth. However, no matter what, no matter what the flow is, our concentration remains the same. So there's a difference between the volume of air that we're delivering as far as liters per minute goes compared to the concentration of oxygen. So if I am going to apply a mask to my patient's face and maintain a seal, that BVM is going to maintain uh, or deliver 100% oxygen at all times, assuming that I'm obviously flowing oxygen into it. However, if I... So let's think critically here. If I were to be performing mouth-to-mask ventilations, what would happen if I were to put a nasal cannula on myself while delivering those ventilations? Now, I know it seems silly, and no, this is not a conventional method, um, but the exam likes to ask questions that, that test your critical thinking skills, that test your general understanding of a concept. So if I were to put a nasal cannula on myself while delivering ventilations through a pocket mask, what would be the outcome? And ultimately, as that nasal cannula is pumping oxygen into the back of my back of my throat, right, that increases the oxygen concentration within uh, within my oropharynx. As I exhale and I breathe through that pocket mask, I'm actually exhaling a greater volume. Or I'm sorry, greater concentration of oxygen. So under normal circumstances, the oxygen in the air that we're breathing right now is about 21%. As I exhale, I exhale about 16% oxygen. Reason being that other 5% that's missing, that amount of oxygen is what was taken up through the, the respiratory uh, functions. So I breathe in 21%, I exhale 16%. If I'm doing mouth to mask ventilations, that means I'm delivering 16% oxygen with every breath that I, I give that patient. If I were to put that nasal cannula on myself and increase the oxygen, uh, oxygen concentration within the, the oropharynx, as I exhale, I'm going to deliver a, a concentration greater than 16%. So the theory there is simply that I could deliver slightly more oxygen while still using my own body as the mechanical component to force that air into the chest. And I know that that's kind of an obscure or an abstract thought, and, and I get it. Um, but again, from a practical standpoint, if we think about the mechanics of breathing, um, it is a, it's a critical thinking step is all it is. Okay. So no, we're not typically going to apply nasal cannulas to ourselves and deliver ventilations through mouth and mask. But if we did, 
that would be a reasonable approach, okay? And again, that is on the exam, so that's why I want to take a couple minutes to talk about that. So another way of delivering positive pressure ventilation is through an FRO PVD, uh, also known as a flow-restricted oxygen-powered ventilation device. Uh, I'll be honest with you, I've never seen one of these used. Um, I don't believe that they're very popular out in the field whatsoever, um, but essentially what it is, is it's a, uh, a machine that pressurizes uh, the air within, um, uh, within the tank, and then as the rescuer here pushes a button, it delivers a pressurized uh, puff of air into the patient. So it's supposed to be a little bit, uh, well, I shouldn't even say that. It's a different technique in delivering those positive pressure ventilations. But there's some downsides to it as far as trying to balance out the pressures and, and make sure that um, it's customized for the patient. So generally speaking, um, with these FRO PVDs, they have alarms on them. And if the alarm is sounding, uh, there's probably an issue with the exhalation valve to the point that it's overpressurized. Uh, again, there's a reason that they're not really utilized uh, pre-hospital anywhere. Um, so... I think you probably know everything you need to know about it just from that little bit of conversation, okay? Um, we do see ventilators once in a while. This is not going to be a BLS skill. You're not going to be expected to utilize a ventilator. However, from time to time, you may be riding in, a, in an ALS ambulance or maybe you're helping out as a driver of a critical care vehicle and you may have some general interaction with ventilators. The other place we'll see these is actually going to be at home. If we have patients that are are chronically ill and they're on home ventilators. Um, you know, if you get a 911 call and you show up, here's this ventilator, what do you do, right? Um, we're not gonna be trained on ventilators. It's not something that you're gonna know how to do proficiently. You're gonna need to uh, utilize a caregiver uh, that knows how to utilize or use the machine, knows how to move the machine, connect, disconnect, do all that stuff. So just understand that a, an automatic transport ventilator or a vent is something that will actually breathe for a patient. Uh, typically these patients are either intubated or they have stomas in place, um, but nothing that you're actually going to be utilizing or having to worry about, okay? So I'm not gonna get into that anymore. Oxygen therapy. So this is probably the, the meat and potatoes of this chapter. When do I need to give my patient oxygen? How much do I give them? Is there a harm to it, etc. cetera? So um, really pay attention here, okay? As, an, as a casual reminder, once more, oxygen is a drug that can cause harm. It's difficult, I and mean, it's going to be hard for you to do something that causes harm to your patient uh, when delivering oxygen, but it is possible. And even though we may not realize the consequences right up uh, while we are interacting with the patient, uh, we may see long-term consequences. So not everybody needs oxygen. There are times that we should specifically not deliver oxygen. You need to pay attention to those instances so that you you have an understanding, okay? You need to be able to articulate indication versus contraindication of uh, oxygen so that we know when it is and is not appropriate. So uh, as far as how to, to get oxygen to the patients, right, there's a few different devices uh, from a portable oxygen tank to onboard oxygen tanks. We'll go through those and talk about them real quick here. Um, you'll see different sizes. That smaller uh, D-cylinder tank, uh, is something that we're going to typically carry. It's attached to our cot. Um, it's small, it's lightweight, it's portable, and allows us to bring it anywhere that we're going. These larger M-cylinder tanks, those are what's actually attached to the ambulance. Those are called onboard oxygen uh, tanks. Uh, very, very heavy, very cumbersome, not something that is portable by any means, um, and it's just strictly to supply the onboard oxygen for the ambulance. Going through these different things here, don't worry too much about uh, memorizing all this stuff. Um, but what you do need to know beyond the, uh, the liters of oxygen per tank is the pressure. And a full pressure tank is between 2,000 and 2,200 PSI. It doesn't matter what size the tank is. It doesn't matter uh, how many liters of air it holds. The pressure will always remain the same. And a full oxygen tank should be between 2,000 and 2,200 PSI. Now, one thing that you'll see is, you know, when to replace the oxygen. When is it too low? Um, on a larger m size tank, you can drop all the way down to about 100 to 200 PSI. You know, those large m size tanks, and again, the m size is the onboard here, right? 
100 to 200 PSI is still a substantial volume of oxygen that should be more than sufficient to treat several patients. But on a smaller tank like one of these things here, such as a D-cylinder tank, if I get down to 100 to 200 PSI, um, that's probably only going to last me a few minutes and it would not be sufficient. So on a small D-sized tank, I need to be changing that out uh, between 300 and 500 PSI. Once it gets down to that pressure, that's the time that I need to swap it out, okay? Um, in addition to that, I need to constantly monitor my patient. Uh, there's been plenty of instances where a patient is put on a non-rebreather mask and all of a sudden that tank runs out during the course of patient care. Nobody realizes it. Well, if a patient is on a non-rebreather mask and there's no oxygen flowing in there, that'll actually suffocate them. That's kind of a big deal, right? So we need to constantly monitor our patient, make sure that the oxygen flow is, is uh, consistent and that nothing happens, okay? Uh, let's see here. The concentration of oxygen within these tanks is 100 PSI. Um, it is medical grade oxygen. Uh, and as you can imagine, it's also highly flammable. So do we allow smoking in or around the ambulance? And the answer is an obvious no. Uh, never drop a cylinder or let it fall against any object. Um, very, very true. Anytime a cylinder is stored in the upright position or standing position, it must be secured. Uh, through a rack or a chain or something like that. Uh, if a tank were to, let's say, fall off the counter and the neck of the tank hit the floor uh, and fracture because it's under such a high pressure, that tank can actually turn into a projectile, it could turn into a missile. And there's been documented cases of stuff like that happening and that, that tank will fly right through a wall, okay? So it's obviously a, a hazard to us. Uh, if it cannot be secured through a chain or a rack or something like that in the upright position, and we should be laying it flat, and we should be making sure that it can't roll anywhere that's going to allow it to fall. Uh, never use oxygen around open flame. I think we just kind of cut covered that. Pressure regulators. What that's going to do is the regulator takes the pressure inside the tank and it uh, dials it down to a uh, pressure that's appropriate for delivering it to the patient. And you'll see here that's an average of between 30 to 70 psi. The other thing those regulators are going to do, though, is that it actually controls a specific volume of air. So obviously, the higher the volume of air we're trying to deliver, the higher the pressure is going to be. Um, and that, don't worry too much about it. We don't need to get into the physics of this. But um, again, the volume of air it will allow us to deliver anywhere from one liter per minute. Some go as low as half a liter per minute, all the way up to 15 liters per minute, or some regulators actually go to 25 liters per minute. And there you go. Those are the flow meters that we were just discussing, okay? Different uh, styles that you can utilize. Um, the hospital has the one on the left. Those are typically mounted to the wall, uh, whereas the one on the right is something that you would see mounted to a portable oxygen tank, okay? And this is exactly what we use here. From time to time, you may be instructed to provide humidified oxygen. Uh, and a lot of times we can do that simply through either a humidifying device or through a nebulizer where we utilize some saline. Um, and all that does is it adds a little bit of moisture to the air so that it doesn't dry the patient's airway out as much. Here's a great picture of uh, one humidified option, okay? So the air goes down through the regulator um, into the, the bottle of saline, or in this case sterile water, kind of bubbles through there, uh, mixes some moisture into the air, and then that moisture is transferred along with the oxygen down through the tube and into the patient. So let's talk about some of the more traditional ways that we're going to administer oxygen to our patients, uh, one of them being a non-rebreather mask. So you should be very familiar with what a non-rebreather mask is, and what its primary functions are, um, and you'll see with the picture coming up here, um, basic components. Now this bag down here, this is act, acts as an air reservoir. Again, th uh, critical thinking question for the exam. To what flow do I need to hook up this oxygen mask in order to make meet the needs of the patient? And again, if we look at the book, the book's going to say to flow a non-rebreather mask at 12 to 15 liters per minute. And that's fine and dandy. However, uh, we have to really think critically here. What ends up happening is as the patient inhales, they draw air out of this reservoir bag, right, and they breathe it in. So with each inhalation, this reservoir bag deflates just a little bit, about 50%. If it sucks dry or if it sucks flat, every time the patient breathes in, 
we're not delivering enough oxygen or we're not delivering a sufficient volume. So think about this. Think about a 100-pound uh, patient, just a, a tiny little frail thing compared to a 300-pound patient. 100 pounds, uh, 5 feet tall compared to 300 pounds, 7 feet tall. Which one do you suppose has a larger tidal volume? Which one requires additional air volume each time they breathe? And obviously, it's going to be that 300-pound, 7-foot-tall giant. In that situation, right, they're going to utilize more air. So they're probably going to need a higher flow rate of oxygen in order to make sure that that reservoir bag doesn't suck dry with each breath. They may need 15, maybe they have to go all the way up to 20 or 25 liters per minute through that non-rebreather in order to meet uh, their volume demands. Comparatively, that 100-pound, 5-foot-tall uh, person is going to utilize much less volume. So for that patient, I could probably flow 12 liters per minute, and it would be more than enough to keep that bag uh, completely inflated. If I'm flowing substantially more oxygen than I need to, all I'm doing is wasting oxygen. Not necessarily going to harm the patient, but I am wasting oxygen, and that is expensive, right? We have to control the cost of our our supplies and as long as we're treating our patients first and foremost being mindful of, of uh, supply costs and stuff like that is equally important for our employers okay so you'll see um, different sizes for different size patients we have adult pediatric and, and infant we also carry um, some smaller neonate simple oxygen masks um, the non rebreather mask as you'll see here is uh, is meant to deliver between 80 and 100 percent oxygen um, so long as I am uh, delivering the proper volume, I should be giving about 80 to 100% oxygen as far as the concentration goes. And it says here again, optimal flow rate is 12 to 15. That doesn't mean that you can't go lower. That doesn't mean that you can't go higher. But it needs to be tailored specific to your patient's needs and the volume that they're trying to breathe in. Nasal cannula is uh, very useful. Great thing about a nasal cannula is that by putting this on a patient, it doesn't interfere with their ability to talk or communicate with us. Uh, Non-rebreather mask from time to time uh, will at least muffle the voice and it's harder to talk with our patients. Nasal cannula though, that's not the case. It's very, uh, it's non-invasive. Simply tuck it into the nose there and it's going to uh, deliver just a supplemental amount of oxygen to try to offset any respiratory distress that the patient may have. You'll see here between 24 and 44 percent oxygen. That is based on the flow rate once again. Um, so we should not be delivering more than six liters per minute, but we could go all the way down to as little as one liter per minute. And it's important that when we're delivering oxygen that we do something called titrate. We only want to give the patient the amount of oxygen that they need. No more, no less. And what that does is that allows us to assess the, or the severity of their respiratory compromise. Um, if I give them one liter per minute and it fixes their problem, they say they feel a lot better. Well, we know that they weren't that bad off in the first place, right? It was a very mild degree of respiratory compromise. However, if I start them on one liter and that's not good enough, I go up to two liters and then four liters and then six liters and they don't start to feel better until six liters, that tells me that they have a probably a more moderate um, respiratory compromise and there could be something pretty significant uh, going on. If I have to go all the way up to a non-rebreather mask then I know that they're really in bad shape, right? These are critical patients. Now when we talk about titration though I do want you to think about this. You know it's important to titrate. We don't want to give them any more than they need and it's good to start low and work our way up gradually, right? But if I walk up to a patient and they're tripoding, they're cyanotic, they're really working hard to breathe, uh, lots of anxiety, all these things are going on. Do I want to start slow and titrate up? No. If I identify that my patient is obviously in severe distress and they really need a lot of help, it is perfectly acceptable to go straight to a non-rebreather mask or other device to deliver that higher volume. Okay, so this is all judgment call. We have to be able to assess our patient. The important thing though is no matter what you decide to do, you need to be able to defend your decision. You need to be able to articulate. Why did you decide to use this device? Why did you decide to uh, deliver this volume of oxygen? Um, you know, did you consider the consequences? Did you consider the benefits? And did you weigh them against each other? So again, simply memorizing numbers and saying, I'm going to flow a na nasal cannula 
at one to six liters per minute is not sufficient. We're going to expect you in class to explicitly explain I'm going to deliver this specific number for this specific reason. You need to be able to defend your decisions. Okay. Partial rebreather masks, don't even worry about those. Those are essentially just uh, oxygen simple masks um, without the uh, reservoir bag on there. Venturi mask also, we don't use those, so nothing that we need to be overly concerned about at this point in time, okay? Tracheostomy masks, though, this is something we, we run into. So patients that have a stoma or that permanent hole in their neck where they can breathe directly into the trachea, uh, they'll have a tracheostomy uh, tube typically inserted in there. And it's a little plastic tube that allows us to clip on and deliver oxygen through there as needed. The volume that we're going to deliver between 8 and 10 liters per minute is really based on the patient's respiratory rate and overall oxygen demands. So we may need to adjust that number up or down a little bit depending on their needs. So there's a, an example of the tracheostomy, uh, tracheostomy mask. Um, if we place that directly over the stoma then, it would allow us to, to breathe into our patient and deliver oxygen directly into the trachea. All right. Moving into special considerations then. So facial injuries. We've had this from, from time to time. Um, I had a, a motorcyclist uh, a few years ago who was thrown from this bike. Um, massive facial trauma to the point that we couldn't even uh, find a way to apply a non-rebreather mask. We had to intubate them. That was the only way that we could control the patient's airway. Um, there was a, a case years back where um, uh, a gentleman was having a real bad day placed a shotgun underneath his chin, pulled the trigger. Um, it did not kill him. It blew the facial structures off the, the front of the cranium, though. So there was no identifiable airway structure that could be utilized to apply certain airway devices. Um, and in those situations, it's really tough. You know, we have this big bloody mess. Uh, we, we can't identify where the, the mouth is, where the trachea is, any of that stuff. So it, it really makes it challenging. Uh, obstructions are a big thing. Anytime we're not getting good chest rise, anytime we're trying to bag a patient and we feel resistance in the bag, we need to ask ourselves why. Is there uh, an obstruction within the airway itself? Am I not utilizing the device properly? Is there a mechanical issue with the device that needs to be fixed or replaced? So um, any indications of instructions or obstructions rather, we need to stop, think about what's going on, identify the problem and fix it before we move on. Dental appliances don't often get in the way, uh, but from time to time, dentures could become an issue. Uh, not a problem if they do. Pull them out, set them to the side. The most important thing here, doesn't matter if you save the patient's life. If you forget to give them their dentures back, they're probably going to hate you forever. So um, dentures are very expensive. Patients rely on having their dentures. If you do have to remove them for whatever reason, be sure that you transfer them uh, back to the patient when you're done. Pediatrics and oxygen. We know that kids thrive on oxygen. Kids must absolutely have oxygen at all times, okay? Um, and it says here children burn oxygen at twice the rate of adults. That's crazy, right? So when we're ventilating our patients, uh, especially kids, uh, we need to make sure that we're ventilating at the appropriate rate. So we know adults, we ventilate at 10 to 12 times per minute. Children, we ventilate at 12 to 20 times per minute. And infants, we ventilate at 20 times per minute, okay? Delivering that additional volume is going to be really important in order for these patients, these pediatric patients, to, to thrive. Um, if we are utilizing uh, a bag valve mask or anything like that, we want to be very careful, though, that we are not delivering too much pressure, right? That, uh, that increased gastric pressure and that decreased cardiac output, both of those things are even more hazardous in kids than they are in adults. So we have to be careful to, to deliver those ventilations slowly, carefully, and at the right pressure. Okay. Assisting with airway advanced airway devices. So you may be assigned to an ALS ambulance or working in a hospital as a tech um, where ALS or advanced uh, skills are performed. You should be at minimum familiar with these things, but really you should be almost proficient in their general uses. While you may not be authorized to insert it, you should understand how they work um, and be able to help troubleshoot, okay? One thing that you'll notice in the hospital when you do your clinical time is that the 
uh, doctor is only as good as the nurses, right? Good quality nurses, a good team of nurses is ultimately what makes uh, a doctor successful. And the same thing applies in ambulances. We rely on our teammates and a good medic benefits a lot from a good quality EMT that understands the, the job functions of both roles and um, is able to, to be a contributing member, okay? So you should be familiar with these advanced airway devices and be able to assist where needed. Um, there's a few different types of devices that are going to be used and actually some of them that used to be considered advanced airway are going to be within the EMT scope of practice. So looking here, uh, this is somebody that's preparing to, to intubate a patient. Um, this alone is an ALS skill, but as the EMT, you could be helping by uh, maneuvering the patient, holding the patient's arms up, repositioning. You may be ready with the bag valve mask or the, uh, the device to secure the tube, all sorts of stuff, okay? So endotracheal intubation or ET intubation is, uh, is an ALS skill that will be performed by paramedics or physicians in the ER. Um, but you'll see here kind of how it works. This is simply for, uh, for familiarity for you. You don't need to know anything about this. But the tube drops all the way down and gets inserted directly into the trachea. This balloon inflates here. And now we're able to deliver air directly into the trachea. And it seals off the esophagus. A few benefits to this. One being that we can stick uh, suction tubing down there. We can suction out the trachea if needed. Um, and then once they're in the hospital, they can insert things like NG tubes and stuff like that um, to, to address... Uh, gastric issues and, and feeding and everything else. We have a few blind insertion airway devices and now uh, all three of these are going to be considered BLS scope of practice. So you will be shown these and uh, expected to utilize these. Combi tube of course being the exception. Combi tube is an older device that we haven't used in several years. Uh, I just included in here as a, a thing so you're familiar with it. There is a chance that if you go somewhere else in the country that they'd still be utilizing this. But essentially what the combi tube does is you'll see here it sits, um, it's supposed to sit into the esophagus and then there's a balloon that inflates here and here. And as you breathe down, the air comes out little holes in the side and goes down into the trachea and ventilates. However, this is kind of a fail-safe device. So if when you uh, insert it, if it were to accidentally go into the trachea, no big deal. You could just then ventilate the other tube, and that's going to deliver air down the trachea that way. Um, so it's considered what, the, or it's what's considered a rescue airway. Um, it's kind of a, a no-brainer. It works well. The downside, though, is that there's quite a bit of trauma that these tubes or these uh, cuffs can do, um, and it doesn't always work as well as we'd like it to. So not too long ago, well, was maybe almost 10 years ago now, we went to what's called a King tube or a King LT airway. And it's a very similar structure, but because of the way it was sized and shaped, um, it never went into the trachea. It was always supposed to go down into the esophagus here. We inflate the two balloons. You notice that there's only one, one port that we can ventilate through. The air comes down, goes out passively through between the balloons, and it travels down into the trachea here. Um, these are still currently on the rigs, but they are going to be replaced with eye gel airways coming up in the near future. Here's your eye gel. So this thing kind of uh, sits down. You just insert it into the airway. No, no balloons to blow up or anything else. And what it ends up doing is it uh, seals around. It, it creates a seal around the glottic opening. So as we're ventilating, we're delivering passively right down into the trachea. Okay. These are all things that we'll cover much more in class uh, in a lot more detail. Laryngeal mask airways or LMA is very similar to the eye gel. Um, this still allows us to inflate a cuff around the, the glottic opening though. Um, these are used frequently in like outpatient surgeries. So if somebody needs to be sedated for a surgery but it's going to be just for a short period of time, they'll throw an LMA in really quick. And again these are all meant to do um, two primary things. One, deliver oxygen into the trachea. Two, block off the esophagus so that there's no risk of vomit or anything else coming up and having them uh, uh, aspirated. So this slide here talks about all the different uh, procedural steps in preparing a patient for intubation or really any of those devices that I just uh, went through and discussed. Um, the primary role of an EMT on an ALS ambulance would be to help prepare the patient, um, deliver supplemental oxygen to oxygenate the patient as well as possible leading up to the, the procedure. 
uh, prepare to um, verify that the tube is in place once the procedure is complete, help secure the tube. Um, really, these are all uh, skills that require several sets of hands in order to make sure that it goes as smoothly as possible. So ventilating an intubated patient changes, right? We said that using a, a, a PPV or a, a bag valve mask, we're going to ventilate them at 10 to 12 times per minute. However, any time that we have an advanced airway in, so the ET tube, the King tube, eye gel, any of those things, we're going to drop our ventilatory rate down to 8 to 10 times per minute. And the reason is, is because now we're not losing any air into the esophagus, right? 100% of the air that we're ventilating through that BVM is being delivered directly to the trachea. Since we're not losing any air, um, we don't need to bag as frequently. We want to drop that, that rate down just a little bit to adjust the, the volume, okay? Uh, trauma intubations, not much going on there that you need to be concerned about. With a trauma intubation, we do what's called inline uh, intubation, which just means that we can't really torque the airway backward to open it up. We need to try to, to maintain that neutral alignment. As an EMT, your job would simply be to maintain that, that neutral C-spine and uh, maybe provide a slight jaw thrust in order for us to try to uh, intubate the patient. And that is it. Um, there's a lot more about oxygen. That was really the, the down and dirty of, of respiratory function. Um, we're going to talk a lot more in class about it, but uh, we expect you to show up to class knowing what the different types of devices are, a basic familiarity with them. You should know by now what your flow rates are for non-rebreathers and nasal cannulas. You should know what your ventilatory rates are using BVMs for adults, kids, and infants. You know, all those general things, the numbers, we expect you to show up and have that stuff memorized and ready to go. In class, we'll start talking a lot more about the in-depth application of these things, uh, procedurally how to use them, indications, contraindications, and then we'll start applying them to different scenarios. So I hope you took a little bit out of this uh, discussion. If you have any questions, reach out to any one of your instructors.